Good evening, attendees from around the world, and welcome to the CEU Executive MBA Berlin Open Day. My name is Thomas Lamel, and I'm the Senior Program Manager of the CEU Executive MBA, and I will guide you through this evening. We will start with the program presentation by faculty co-director, Professor Yusuf Akbar. Thereafter, you will have the chance to meet current participants and alumni. Then Professor Austin Lee Nichols will deliver a research presentation on what do you want in leaders? And if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot them in the chat box and I will collect them for the Q&A session at the end of the evening. I will pass the baton to Yusuf now. Let me introduce Yusuf to you. Um, Yusuf, Professor Yusuf Akbar is our faculty co-director and associate professor of strategy. He has published over 40 journals, journal articles, four books, and numerous contributions to academic and professional research in strategy and international business. He's the founding editor of the International Journal of Emerging Markets and an advisor to governmental authorities. He's consulting, um, his consulting and professional references include Citibank, Deutsche Telekom, Siemens, Texas Instruments, and Toyota. Joseph, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to our uh, CU Executive MBA uh, Open Day. I'd like to spend a few minutes with you now uh, walking through the program. Uh, you know, I think um, we are, it's become, you know, almost like a tired cliche that um, we face uh, quite unbelievably uncertain times. Um, if you cast your mind back um, to 2008, 2009, we had mouth water, uh, you know, eye-watering um, bailout packages of $800 billion by the US government to bail out the financial services industry. Um, we are now on the verge, um, just over a decade later, to have uh, the US government spend $1.9 trillion dollars on a bailout package uh, because of the pandemic. And in between these two extraordinary events, uh, we had the largest refugee crisis in Europe uh, since uh, 2015. And I think um, as a consequence, uh, a lot of people are asking, um, you know, uh, what's the point of an MBA uh, in a world that is becoming increasingly difficult uh, uh, to navigate and to predict. I mean, just if you look at my slide here, we've got a bunch of issues just worth mentioning. The, um, the rapid and far-reaching digital transformation of uh, both organizations, but also individuals' lives. Uh, being stuck on Zoom has, has been an extraordinary transformation in the way in which we, we communicate in the last year. And while I think some of the things that we had before the pandemic will come back, I think what we're also going to see is an acceleration of trends that were already in place. Um, if you look at it, you know, from a kind of strategy perspective, we're moving away from thinking about traditional uh, industry level analysis to what we call ecosystem analysis, two-sided markets, network effects, and the like towards most valuable companies all leverage strategies um, of that kind. And then I think if you, if you, if you, you know, broaden it out even further, um, you can see um, an increasing polarization within society across um, seemingly un, un, um, seemingly opposite views of how the world should run. So on the one side, you've got sort of, you know, the rise of populism um, and an increase in the role of culture and cultural politics and identity driving um, what goes on. Um, on the other hand, um, you've got, an increasingly unstable geopolitical context and the emergence of new uh, important players in the world geopolitical system. So I think, you know, an MBA um, in this context needs to sort of um, respond uh, to these changes. And, um, you know, if you look in the media, uh, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, is it, is it really worth doing an MBA? And I think I would like to communicate with you this evening that in fact, it is indeed a very important time uh, to go to get to go get an MBA, but the way I want to go about it is to sort of give you an idea of you know MBA programs and the fact that you know not all MBA programs um, are alike. You know, let's just start for a minute with one kind of MBA program, you know, which is an MBA that you would take in the city where you are based. Yeah, and in many instances, most of those 
um, MBA programs will have a fairly standardized curriculum doing pretty standard, uninspiring, uh, some may say even plain vanilla type things. Most of the time you'll have local faculty um, who are teaching the program. And while you'll have a contingent of international students, maybe 20% of the class, it's relatively few. Um, you know, it's, um, it, it won't be cheap, you know, it'll, it'll be, you know, up to 80,000 uh, euros tuition plus expenses. Um, but the key thing is, is you don't have to interrupt your work. And so in that sense, there is a convenience factor, which I think is very important. And then if you, you know, um, kind of go to the other end of the scale, uh, and you think about the leading business schools in the world by that, you know, these are the schools that, you know, that, that routinely are top of the rankings that are, you know, the Harvard's London Business School, INSEAD, um, and so on. If you look at their programs, uh, they're, they're really quite different. I mean, the first thing is, is that, you know, these programs for a whole bunch of reasons have got to the top, but one of them is that they have very, very differentiated mission-driven curri uh, MBA curriculums in contrast to sort of the local MBA program. Um, because often these are full-time programs, you have a much more international student body, uh, at least higher than 20%, I would say. Um, you know, it's a full-time program, so you get to experience a campus-type um, feel to, to your studies, uh, great faculty, uh, top credentials. Um, but, the, you know, the, the ticket price is substantially higher, you know, a minimum of €120,000 tuition plus expenses, Plus, of course, you know, you have to step out of your career for a year, uh, and in some cases, two years, particularly North American, leading North American MBA programs. And, you know, you may have to relocate your family. And so what we're trying to do at, uh, at CU Executive MBA is actually try and benefit from the best of both worlds. And this is the EMBA uh, for the open world. And what are the key uh, key features. Well, first of all, um, thanks to the largest endowment of a university in continental Europe um, given to us through Open Society Foundations and our founder, George Soros, uh, we offer a tuition rate of €25,000, which is substantially lower than what you would get um, both locally in some instances and definitely in these top, these, uh, these top, uh, top rated um, MBA programs. Um, like the local programs, there's no work interruption because we have a modular format. I'll come back to that um, later on. Um, you will also get to benefit from a, a world-class campus experience. Um, our, our founder has invested uh, millions of euros in creating state-of-the-art um, uh, campus facilities um, and so on. Uh, a very, very international student body. We have uh, CEU is one of the most international universities in the world with more than 100 nationalities represented. And as you'll see momentarily, um, our program also has global faculty with fantastic uh, credentials. Um, I'll give you a few examples here. Uh, Professor Claudia Steinbender, uh, a macroeconomist, um, PhD LSE, uh, faculty at MIT uh, and at Harvard, who's now um, our, our professor, uh, uh, Miklos Koren, who leads probably the best data analytics graduate program in Europe, um, PhD from Harvard. Um, Mike LaBelle, who's the Jean Monnet Chair in Energy Innovation Studies, um, one of the leading thinkers in, in sort of green growth um, and renewable technologies. Um, my fellow co-director, Maciej Kishilowski, um, Yale INSEAD Princeton graduate, uh, a specialist in what we call non-market strategy, which is one of the core modules in the program, which kind of focuses as on how companies align their market strategies with their political uh, and societal uh, pressures. Um, Joy Chan, who is uh, probably the highest rated faculty member uh, in the program, teaches finance and is especially uh, good at teaching um, MBAs with relatively little experience of finance, a very, very inclusive methodology. And I, I know that many of our EMBAs really appreciate um, her contribution in the classroom. Uh, Adam Zawodowski, PhD Princeton, who's uh, a leading thinker in asset pricing uh, and asset management, very good at sort of taking you know, abstract finance theory and making it applicable um, in practice. And these are just our full-time faculty. 
Um, in addition, we have a, a raft of just outstanding visiting faculty. Uh, Christian Silas from Stanford is our professor of innovation. Uh, Miklos Shavari teaches uh, digital marketing. He's based at Columbia. Omar Hernandez comes over from UC Berkeley to uh, teach operations. Uh, professor Hui Chen from U University of Zurich is a professor of accounting. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Milena Nikolova is um, a specialist in behavioral economics and tourism. So this is what the program looks like. Uh, as you can see, um, it's kind of set up into the modules. Uh, we start in August uh, with a nine day module. And then most of the modules aside uh, from uh, the, the first modules are four day long, except for our summer modules. Uh, and it's important to note that in our summer modules, we have two focuses. Uh, we have some core classes, our leadership program and electives. And you know the electives are an opportunity for you to kind of uh, do two things, try some new areas which you think might be valuable for your professional development, but it also gives you an opportunity to do a little bit of focus as well by taking electives in related areas. So outside of the nine day modules, we have typical four day modules. You come in on a Thursday or a Friday and you leave on a Sunday or a Monday, which is great because you can sort of plan your work around that. Another important thing about our program structure and our scheduling is we've chosen to place our modules around as many popular public holidays in Europe, which will sort of reduce the number of days you would have to take off work and take vacation days uh, to complete the program. Um, uh, another very important part um, of this program is the fact that once you graduate from CEU, you'll be part of a global network of CEU alumni, um, many, many countries have alumni chapters, uh, very active. And of course, as an alumnus or an alumna of CEU, you will get access to all of the high quality alumni services that the university offers uh, to its graduates. I wanna give you a little bit of background about how we've got to this place. You know, how is it possible that a program of this quality is able to um, offer offer it at a price of just 25,000 euros. And the answer to that lies in the fact that we are one of the best supported universities um, in Europe. Um, some of you may have been aware of the fact that we were originally based in Budapest uh, when we were first founded, um, but due to political circumstances with the Hungarian government, we were forced uh, to move uh, to Vienna. However, we maintain our campus in Budapest, both as a symbolic statement of our continued engagement with Hungary, but also uh, its state of the art facilities, and we can allow uh, residencies to take place on the campus. So uh, as a participant of the CU Executive MBA, uh, you'll be able to benefit from both the Vienna and Budapest campuses. Uh, I will also add that as an alumnus of CU Executive MBA, every year you'll have an opportunity to come back and take electives um, in the program, and that's especially important given the fact that we'll be able to offer around 50 electives in total, but you won't have been able to take uh, some of those electives first time around. Um, we, we have an endowment of, um, of a billion euros, a billion dollars, um, which means that we um, are able to do things educationally, which other schools that rely heavily upon tuition have not been able to do. Um, I'll, I'll draw your attention to a number of scholarship opportunities um, for this program that can help defray the 25,000 euro cost. We have two categories. We have need-based uh, scholarships, which focus on a, an applicant's um, annual income. And we have merit-based scholarships, which have specific country level themes. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, in the Q&A, we can kind of get at some of those specifics. For example, I'll just give you a couple of examples while I have the chance. You know, we have uh, we have uh, fellowships for female um, executives in certain countries. We have uh, fellowships for entrepreneurs. <clears throat> we have fellowships for folks in the not for profit sector. And that brings me back to this concept of open society, which is the bedrock of our university. Our classroom is probably one of the most diverse classrooms you'll encounter in an MBA program worldwide. Uh, it won't be full of just highly successful, ambitious corporate executives, you'll be joined by very ambitious, uh, uh, very mission-driven uh, leaders of uh, advocacy organizations, as well as entrepreneurs, 
uh, startup founders and uh, also successful uh, public uh, sector uh, executives. Uh, and the EMBA for the open world is basically based upon the following principles. Um, I think in today's world uh, of fake news, um, narratives uh, are beginning to kind of dominate popular discourse. Uh, and what we do at, at the EMBA for the open world is we borrow the bedrock principle of open society thinking, which is facts, not narratives, and falsification. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that we take a particular political position on anything. We believe that every idea, wherever it comes from, uh, can be challenged through what we call radical uh, rationality. Um, we believe firmly um, that diversity is a strength, not a weakness. So in a political climate where you're hearing increasingly kind of ethno-nationalist sentiment, we actually argue that organizations are much stronger when they're diverse. Uh, we obviously fight against prejudice in all of its forms uh, as part um, of our program. Um, and, we, and we see managers across all of the main sectors as positive change agents. So when you join us at the EMBA for the open world, you won't be just getting absolutely top-notch quality management education you're going to be get, being given opportunity to explore, challenge, reconsider some of the most fundamental ideas in society and do it in a very diverse classroom. Uh, the current cohort has uh, 65 managers with 14 years average work experience, of which a minimum of three years leadership experience. Um, uh, you're going to hear from one of our current participants momentarily and one of our illustrious uh, alumni, and they're going to tell you about um, the kinds of people that they had an they have an opportunity to work with or had an opportunity to work with. And our modular format engages you in what we call high level strategic decision making and leadership training. And if, if, if anyone was to ask me what our, you know, what our catchphrase is, is we take you from the uh, operational level uh, to the strategic level. You can see in the image um, uh, behind uh, the text, this is a typical classroom that we operate. I mean, obviously this was done before uh, physical distancing uh, was in place. This was before the pandemic, but you can see the, the kind of layout of the classrooms we have, the Harvard style classrooms, state of the art technology and a very inclusive, um, open um, way of learning and very interactive uh, case-based approach. So the tuition is 25,000 euros. Um, since it's a modular program, you know, you'll be coming in uh, to Vienna and Budapest. We've negotiated special rates at our partner hotels in Vienna and Budapest to, you know, to, suit, to suit all, all tastes and prices from five-star hotels to more affordable three-star options. We've also got flight discounts, which we've negotiated with Austrian Airlines and Lufthansa Group. Uh, as well. And, you know, given the current situation, the more people they can get on planes, the better. I don't know whether you saw uh, Lufthansa's um, financials for 2020, but they were pretty catastrophic, 7 billion euro loss um, and so on. Important uh, deadline is June 6th, 2021. Uh, that's the deadline for an August start. So um, that's, that, that's all from me, but I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, but I'm going to hand back to um, Thomas. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yusuf. I think it's one thing to hear about um, the executive MBA from the program office, but I think it's the other thing to uh, hear about the program from people who have already done it or are in the program right now. And I would like to um, welcome to introduce uh, Benjamin Fischer to you now. He's the program manager of Alfred Landecker Foundation based in Berlin. And um, Benjamin, if you could just introduce yourself shortly and tell us, you know, like what's your background and why you decided to, to do an, an executive MBA at CEU. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for the introduction, Thomas, and obviously thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> I started my career uh, leading an NGO in Brussels, uh, mainly focusing on uh, human rights. And then afterwards became a consultant focusing on uh, change management, but still uh, human rights lobbying. And in my next steps, uh, career steps, I, I started taking a deeper dive and, and really fo focusing on um, digital re legislation and, and dig what, what I would call digital citizenship. First, leading a think lab on digital transformation and now 
uh, as program manager of the Alfred Landecker Foundation, where I'm really covering the intersection of tech and politics. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm 30 years old. I live in Berlin. I've been living in, in Brussels. I studied uh, in Hamburg before. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm a glad participant of the program, I, I guess. So what is your impression now of with regard to um, the, the structure of the program? You know, you're in modules. It's not a full-time program. You're in modules. How do you, like, what's the combination in your life with um, work and your private life and your uh, degree? Sure. So the very reason for why I decided to take this degree um, was because I, I think um, back then I thought and now I know that um, it does allow me to keep on focusing on my career, where really my main focus still lies, but at the same time advancing my career as I'm doing it. So the program back then promised me that with this modular structure, there would be a clear separation between when I, times when I have to focus on my studies and times when I can focus on my work. And this really, really, really um, uh, did come into practice. I mean, just right now I'm, I'm focusing on my preparations for the fourth module. And, uh, you know, I, I got what I was promised for. So I have a set amount of, of hours per week that I know that I have to uh, concentrate on my reading. But other than that, I can, you know, keep on focusing on my life. Um, which for me was the main reason for why I decided to take up this degree, really. I think one thing that is not obvious on, on first sight is that the modular format allows international um, professionals to actually commute to the modules because they wouldn't be able to commute to full-time or part-time programs, uh, to part-time programs that uh, take place on a bi-weekly basis. Uh, can you briefly talk about the diversity in class, but not only with regard to nationalities, but also with regard to industry backgrounds? Sure. So first of all, commuting back then in the first modules, we did commute to Budapest um, and, and I had absolutely no, no issues with that. Uh, obviously, again, the promise that was given to me in the beginning was also held up here. With regard to diversity in the program, it really is as Yusuf has said. So I myself um, come from, I would say more of the public sector slash civil society. Um, but in class, I, I face people coming from all sorts of, of uh, areas. And I was specifically looking for a degree that would not only give me business insights, but would also enhance my um, network with regard to the sector that I'm living in. Um, just to give you an example, in the very working group that, that, I'm, that I'm in, because uh, you know, you have these, these small groups, that the peer groups uh, in, in which you work a lot. I have someone working in pharma. I have someone who um, has founded a, a startup. I have someone who is working in uh, renewable energies and I have someone who's running an NGO. Um, and I think this really exemplifies how the program looks like. I uh, sit together in class with political activists and I sit together with business executives. And obviously bringing these mindsets together allows for, well, sometimes very challenging but at most um, uh, uh, advancing uh, discussions, really. Yeah, I think the, you described the, the the learning experience pretty pretty perfectly because I mean it shows you know the the purpose of diversity. It's not about you know having people from different cultures for a marketing brochure, but being exposed to different approaches, different right. you know decision making uh, theories and and practices. Right. Um, and just to give you a number, in the current cohort, we have people coming from five continents despite of the uh, corona crisis. I think this is quite outstanding. And I think it's, it, it shows how people trust, have trust, uh, uh, put, put trust in the program and committed themselves in these challenging times, of course. Absolutely. I mean, I haven't even spoken about the difference of cultural backgrounds, uh, the different languages that, that, that we hear. On the one hand, because it is becoming somewhat natural, mm. um, which is great. Um, on the other hand, because I've been, I'm used to working in international settings, I must say, but also there the program really stick to its promises. Um, I mean, the different time zones alone that we have in our peer group are, are leading to interesting working times sometimes. Uh, but again, we are super flexible in deciding on right. where we want to go. Uh, Benji, Benjamin, thank you very much for uh, contributing. I would like to ask Martin. He's uh, the, the Martin Herget. He's the strategic business development lead at Home HT in Berlin. Um, I would like to ask you 
um, to um, introduce yourself uh, briefly to the to the attendees and maybe tell us something you know why you chose um, CEU back then. Hello everyone, uh, this is Martin. Also, also now Berlin based. Um, I'm. It's a, it's an interesting question. You know, very briefly, I was uh, attending university in Germany. I was doing freelance work mostly in sort of the you know old digital economy. We're building websites and stuff. I really thought I need to broaden broaden my mind. And in CU, I can come to the details, but I broadened on the cultural background of the people a lot, but also on the experience. And uh, as I heard from Ben from you know executives to to sort of ngo leaders and someone in my group was working at the un and so on um after cu i worked as a consultant at the boston consulting group for quite a while i think seven years and since two years i returned to, to germany and i'm uh, in the startup scene where you know things are very challenging and, and sort of yet yet another perspective and yet, yet another another spin on the story um i think the most, you know, the, the most challenging thing in the first couple of weeks, but most rewarding things in, over the, of the time of the program was the completely different working styles of people uh, when there's no right and wrong. And it, yes, it has something to do a little bit of nationality. Of course, there's a, you know, a cliche of uh, Germans being a sort of focused and some people from Latin American countries being more all over the place, but that's not the main point. The main point is really you come to these discussions and you have fundamentally different, you know, a Chinese person might be more willing on, you know, a sort of top down solution, while somebody from America might more sort of on, on a bottom up solution. Let's ask everyone for their opinion, especially Canadians. And that was very interesting because we had to come to solutions. We had a class where we, uh, I'm not sure if it exists still, where we had to work sort of on a consulting project on a, on a company. And, you know, we needed to represent our group and, you know, our professional opinion to the actual real clients in the outside world. But we first had to come to one uh, ourselves. And I think that was for me really, really like a stepping stone in my career because coming from a German university with sort of 20% uh, internationals, uh, it was still sort of a homogenous way of thinking. And once I had to integrate, you know, a Canadian, Chinese, Turkmen and Bulgarian and myself, like in one presentation, uh, that, was a, that was a whole new, whole new challenge. And a uh, good one, I, I learned a lot. Can you uh, tell us something more about the alumni network? I mean, just, just to put it in context for, for the attendees here, we got to know through the alumni network, we didn't know before. Um, yes. And I just reached out to you if you were willing to, um, to join us for this open day and you spontaneously said yes. And uh, maybe you can show, um, prove it to the attendees how the <laughs> alumni network is. I mean, how the accessibility is, you know, how approachable it is. Please, yeah. please. I think I think there's two uh, there, as in every alumni network, you know, there's a there's a, a base layer of oh, there's this name recognition, and of course, if somebody you know studied at Harvard and then reaches out to another one who studied at Harvard ten years earlier, they'll probably take take a first you know first email or first call. But I think CU is a little bit more than that. Um, it's not just name recognition or your father, my father. You know, people, or at least many people from my class believe in this mission. And I knew Shorosh before, I knew the Open Society found, Foundation before, you know, I actually knew Popper before, who was sort of a, a philosopher that uh, young Shorosh studied under in, in, in London in I don't know, the 50s maybe. So I was predisposed to this. And, you know, there was a degree of, of people in the class, some more business focused, some more NGO focused, but I think we all shared this, this vision that, you know, the world is not only run on power, there is something like human rights and, and we should make it a better world together. And I think there's this there's this connection when you when you reach out to a fellow fellow CEO the, that there's a mission of the whole university, and that's the other interesting thing about the network. It's not only the MBA program, and it's not only a tit for tat. I was actually introduced to very interesting people, uh, even on random events who were you know because there were these uh, modules in Budapest, or because uh, there's this iLab of of entre entrepreneurship uh, residents uh, where you know you meet you meet people just because there's something interesting and there's not always an, an, an agenda behind. Um, for my particular career, actually, I didn't get my job through CU Network, but, but that's not the point. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gladly, I'm glad to take a call uh, from somebody in the CU Network. Thank you very much. And I think Yusuf already pointed out the, the alumni network of CEU 
is a network of 18,000 professionals all around the world. So wherever you go, basically, literally everywhere, there is a local chapter, a local hub where you can mingle, make friends, you know, um, have a professional network or just have a drink or, you know, just meet in your, in your free time. The last question I would like to ask you, because you're an alumni and you can um, maybe reflect on that. What's the impact on your career? Like, what's the learning, the, the, the learning outcome that you... Oh. Oh, uh, I mean, really big because this this really prepared me for the for the global uh, uh, global business world. I mentioned I started in consulting, and I mean two elements. The first one I alluded to really like getting to know different working styles, and you know you come as a young consultant and you work with very senior executives, and I wouldn't have survived this without you know first going a little bit through the fire in the in the MBA program to actually meet people from very different backgrounds of you know different values, different. Uh, nationalities and so on but also the thinking and the content and uh, particularly I think I remember Yusuf's class because it was uh, it was sort of a little bit new for me to have this American style case studies you know you prepare your you're not learning an argument you, you're preparing an argument and defending it and maybe changing your mind based on what others say and the other element um, uh, I think it's not good enough to have this business classes in the sense of, you know, accounting, marketing and so on, uh, and even strategy, this, this sort of classical business classes, because I would say the world is more complex. It's not just business, you know, and politics, but there's this, this sort of public sector thing in between. And you have to understand what, you know, the business decisions are driven by regulation or driven by, uh, you know, by the values, you know, ESG investing or, or whatnot. And I think, we had quite a few classes where, where it was around this, okay, where, where sort of non, non-monetary decision-making. Um, one of them was uh, with, with Maciej about sort of the public policy framework that the, framework that the EU applies to, to different businesses and how to navigate this one. And I think that's an important thing. Even if you stay purely in business, you're not only in business. Like this question about, you know, what does, what does our business do to the society or what might society do to our business? is like, is a fundamental one. And I think CU is well placed because, uh, I mean, the classes I experienced, but also because it's, it's embedded in this um, university that has a strong sort of political science uh, tradition and, uh, and the economics department and so on. It, it, it belongs there. It's not that somebody who's done, you know, 100 years of pure business only now hires sort of one public policy professor. It's actually rooted in the, in the university CU. Yeah. I would like to uh, take the opportunity and thank Benny and uh, Martin for joining us tonight uh, uh, and giving us some insight from the participants and the alumni perspective. I would like to move on to the next part of uh, tonight's event, to the research presentation um, by Aus Professor Austin Lee Nichols. Austin is, um, just to give you some context of who he is, he's the director of the Research Connection Lab. He's an organizational social psychologist of our CEU leadership program. His academic experience comes from the University of Florida to the Beijing University HSBC, HSBC Business School to the University of Navarra. And he's, as you can read, he's dedicated to the application of psychological, psychological principles and empirical research to improve people's lives worldwide. And he will just shine with his presentation. Please, Austin, you've got the floor. Thank you very much, Thomas. I, I like to take my experience, and I do this in the classroom as well and as in my research, from all over the world and, and really try to understand how to make people's lives better, and in particular in the workplace. And one of the ways that I do this and focus the most is through leadership, because I think leadership is, is really at the forefront um, of all of what makes organizations run and, and makes them successful. And so what I wanna talk about today is really the answer to this question of what do you want in your leaders? It's a question I've been asking for many years and it's a question I continue to ask and really be interested in, in finding the, the fairly complex answer to. And so to begin, I wanna just first define what we're talking about with leadership. There, there are a million ways to define leadership. One of my favorite definitions is fairly straightforward and simple. It's the ability to influence a group toward the achievement of a vision or set of goals. So importantly here, we're talking about groups and we're talking about anyone, whether an 
in a formal position or in an informal position that is able to bring the group together, influence them and bring them towards a certain goal or vision. So with that in mind, I want to focus the presentation in, in part on this broad question, but really specifically on leader personality. And so to, the plan for today is to talk a little about leader behavior, bring that into this idea of leader styles and, and some of the research that's been done on different styles of leadership. And then to end in leader personality, within that, I wanna talk about what are called implicit leadership theories, which is kind of the first attempt, I would say, for people to try to figure out what people want in leaders. And then in my research, which I call trait desirability, which is in fact, what is it that you want um, in your leader, specifically with their personality or their traits. So the one place I think that's really interesting to begin is with behavior, because a lot of what we think about with leaders and a lot of what organizations do is focus on what is it that leaders do rather than who they are. And at the very beginning of the research on leader behavior, there were several studies that really tried to understand what is it that leaders do? Just the simple descriptive question. And interestingly, I'm showing the Ohio State studies here, but the University of Michigan did a very similar study around the same time, and they found the same thing, which is that most behaviors that leaders do can be categorized as either task focused or person or relationship focused. And you can see they came up with some fancy terms for those, initiating structure and consideration. But to be clear, they're either focused on the task or focused on the people and the relationships. So this kind of merged into this idea of leader style. And leaders, the focus on leader styles is the idea that if you look at how someone overall behaves, how they act in a certain situation, how they interact with other people, all of this together, kind of their complete behavior, this can give you an idea of their style and that some styles are more effective than others. And so one of the most popular of these is transformational leadership. And what you can see here from this figure is that on the top right, you have the very effective and active styles of leadership. On the bottom left, you have the less effective or ineffective ones and the more passive. So starting from the bottom left, you can see that laissez-faire is really kind of the worst. It's doing nothing, essentially. As we move up that continuum, we get to contingent reward, which is still not transformational leadership, but it's very, very common. And as you can see, it kind of sits right in the middle. Intellectual stimulation, there's this kind of intellectual rigor that happens within the group that really stimulates and interests people in what the, the goals are of the group. That then is combined with inspirational motivation. So getting people really excited about and inspired to do what it is that the group's trying to do. And then finally, idealized influence. So the leader acts in the way that he or she is trying to get others to, leads by example. And together these four, and you can see they each start with an I. So generally these are called the four I's. These make up transformational leadership. But transformational leadership is only one of many styles. Now, rather than cover them all, I'm gonna talk about just a few of the newer ones as well to get an idea for kind of what we find is effective in leaders and what people generally want their leaders to be. And so the next one is authentic leadership. And the simple thought of this is that people want leaders who know who they are, know what they believe in, know what they value, and act on those. So they act consistently with that. And if people do that as leaders, then followers want to follow them because they see this person stands for what they believe in, they can be trusted, and therefore I wanna follow them. The next one, is ethical leadership, which as you can tell, really is about ethics. It's about the leaders focusing on their own ethical behavior, as well as trying to get their subordinates 
to be as ethical as possible. And the more kind of, especially in the last decade or so, this has become more and more important as many kind of corruption scandals and ethical issues have come up in different forms of leadership and in different leadership roles around the world. And then the most recent one is servant leadership. And again, without going too much into it, just to introduce you to the concept that servant leaders are about others, not about themselves. So they go beyond what's, what's best for them, essentially, and their selfish interests, and they instead focus on the, their subordinates, trying to make, help them grow and develop. And so they listen, they empathize with their followers, and they really actively try to develop the potential of each of their followers. And so they are serving, in a way, their subordinates rather than kind of the traditional view of leadership, which is that the subordinates are serving the leader. And so then it becomes a much more group process. So again, I wanted to give you a little about that just because I think it's important in the larger question of what do people want in their leaders. But what I really want to focus on today and, and for the rest of this presentation is leader personality. So the research here looks at who the person is, not what they do. And often, and kind of historically, these are very different questions because what people do is thought to be something that can be developed and changed, whereas who someone is, is often thought to be not changeable. And in fact, there is some research in personality suggesting that people's personality does change a little over time, but for the, for the most part, it does stay fairly stable. Now, I wanna say from the, from the forefront, to me though, it's about both understanding who someone is, but also how they present that person to others. And I'll kind of come around to that a couple times over the next few minutes. So the, probably the easiest way to think about personality, and at least in research, one of the most common is called the five-factor model of personality. For those of you who are familiar with MBTI, it's essentially the same idea except it has a whole lot more research and application in leadership and psychology research and organizational research for that matter. And so what it suggests is that the five factors make up an entirety of someone's personality. So rather than needing 200 descriptors of who someone is, you can look at five things about the person and get a general understanding of their overall personality. The first of those is extroversion. Just like you've heard before, nothing new about this. It is exactly what we generally talk about. It's someone being comfortable with relationships, wanting to be around others, being sociable. One that often is not talked about outside of research is this idea of openness to experience. So research really focuses on how open are people to new things? How creative are, are they? How curious are they? Do they prefer to kind of try something new or stay in their comfort zone, which would be someone that's low in openness? Another one is agreeableness. Again, this is generally spoken about, so it's pretty obvious uh, what it is, but it's someone who's cooperative, warm, that trusts others, generally is not gonna push back or disagree with someone. Emotional stability, this is the idea that you're calm, you're confident, you're secure. You're generally not gonna react emotionally to different circumstances. Whereas the opposite side, which would be neuroticism, these people are nervous, anxious, depressed, insecure. And then finally, conscientiousness. And really, I'm gonna say right away, conscientiousness seems to be one of the most effective traits in anyone in organizations, period, when it comes to personality because these people are reliable, they're responsible, they're organized, they're dependable, and that's generally a good thing in just about all contexts. So when we look at all of this personality research, we can really narrow it down to a few things that make leaders successful. And that's leaders like to be around people, they're able to assert themselves, so they're extroverted, they're disciplined and able to keep commitments that they make, so they're conscientious, and they're usually very creative and flexible, they're open. And so what this brings us to is beyond what makes leaders 
more successful and to what makes a leader someone who a follower wants to work for and what makes that follower more successful with a certain leader. So these implicit leadership theories, really this is a, a cognitive idea, a cognitive representation of what do I think about when I think of a leader? Everybody has one. And so Lord and colleagues for many years tried to answer this question. What do people think of when they think of a leader? So they're looking at typical leaders, things that are characteristic. They're looking at prototypes, response times. Again, things very cognitive. And they found quite a bit of evidence that the more people have a leader that fits their, what I would call a stereotype, or the characteristics that they believe that leaders have, the more successful those leaders tend to be and the happier those followers are. The thing that I took issue with is as important as, it, important as I believe this is, I think they were missing the mark in trying to find what people want in a leader. Because if you want to know what people want, you have to ask them what they want, not what they expect. So an example, if I have a leader and or if I am asked, what is a president of a nation normally like? What's, what's typical? What's characteristic of this person? I might say that they lie, cheat, and steal, because that's what I believe is typical of a leader in that position. Does that mean that that's what I want? that person to be? Not necessarily. And in that case, I don't think anyone wants a president of any nation to be lying and cheating and stealing. And so I really focus the question now on what do people want in a leader? So I'm looking at what people find is ideal, what's desirable for them. And asking them to prioritize in those leaders. And across a lot of studies, I've asked several research questions, but I want to present just a couple of studies that are very focused here for the, the last few minutes of today's presentation. One is just what traits do people desire in all leaders? Okay, so every leader. Are there traits that no matter who the leader is, where they are, what they do, what level they're at, that people want those leaders to have? The second one was how does trait desirability differ across roles. So now we're looking at context. So one leader versus another, what traits are desired in the leader A versus leader B, and what might help us understand that? And then finally, but potentially most important of all, is this predictive of important organizational outcomes? So is it important? And I'm gonna answer these questions or begin to answer these questions at least in this order. And one last thing to keep in mind, and this goes with the research question number two, is the general idea that people have different behaviors and that different behaviors are effective and potentially even desirable in different situations. So without looking too hard at this figure, ho hopefully it's a good reference for you in the future, but for now, just look and see that there are task-oriented behaviors and relationship-oriented behaviors, like we started this presentation talking about. And you can see the, the performance of leaders depends on how much of task and relationship-oriented lead, um, leadership or behaviors they exhibit. But that changes dramatically based off the situation. And you can see going left to right, this situation's changing over time. And so is the need for the leader to change his or her behavior. And so it's important to understand that there are differences in context. We can't expect that all leaders are the same way, and that's always going to be successful. Another way to think about that is leader skills. So kind of a, a summary of different levels of leadership suggests that the skills needed at each level are quite different. So you can see, for example, at the lowest level of leadership, technical skills are one of the most important. At the highest level, technical becomes a lot less important where conceptual becomes a lot more important to have that bigger picture in mind. And so I took this idea and looked at leader level. So this was based on this idea of structural distance or how far we are from our leaders. So the idea is low level leaders have more contact with us. They're maybe our immediate supervisor. And so we might want interpersonal traits. We might want to 
get along well with this person. And this might be most important to us. When we look at high level leaders, we have less contact with them. So maybe that doesn't matter as much. So maybe we want them to be more dominant, kind of traditional leadership traits as, as people would often think of them. And so to really answer this question, I decided it was best to get people who knew nothing about leadership. So I took freshman students and I said, okay, in an ideal world, what do you want leaders to be like? And I gave them two different levels of leadership across several domains. So you can see those include education, sports, military, um, social groups, traditional work groups, and even political groups. So I took low and high level leaders and I asked them for each one, which of these traits they thought was most important. So how important is agreeableness? How important is this level of big five? Also interpersonal traits, traits related to dominance, and then intelligence, because intelligence has always emerged in leadership research as important. And the gist of what I found is that people didn't desire all the traits the same. So it really does matter. Even if people can have high everything, they don't actually desire that. Trustworthiness and intelligence seem to be two of those kind of consistently valued traits above all the others. So some evidence already emerging for this idea of across all leaders, what traits may be universally valued. And then I also found that there were some traits that really did differ based off the level of leadership. And in particular, people wanted leaders in higher level leadership to be more ambitious, more assertive, and more courageous than they did of their counterparts in the same domains, but at lower levels. So the next thing I did then is I took employees and asked them about their supervisor. So taking these same traits, tell me about your current supervisor. Then I asked them what you would expect in someone in that role and what you would want someone in that role to be like. And really the quick and dirty results here were that the, the difference between what people wanted and what they actually had, so the desired difference I call it here, these were, this was very predictive of how satisfied people were of their relationship with their leaders and of their commitment to the organization. But when you considered that, the difference between what people expected in that leader and what that leader was like didn't seem to matter. So this was some initial support for the idea that what people want is important and is, in, is potentially more important than just fulfilling their expectations. And so the takeaway from this, and I'm gonna kind of go beyond just the results that I showed you today to the several other studies I've run, there appears to be a desired leadership core. So trustworthiness, intelligence, but also ambition seem to be the three traits that most people want in most leaders, which makes sense. You want a leader you can trust, you want a leader who knows what they're doing, and you want a leader who wants to lead, who's ambitious, who's interested in excelling in that position. All the other traits seem to really differ based off the role. This includes the level, like I just talked about, but also the domain, so the role of the group seems to matter in what people want in their leaders, and even the experience of the subordinates seem to play a part. And so in all, my research is continuing to collect evidence and suggest that organizations really need to do the simple task of asking people what they want in their leaders and considering that when choosing leadership roles and when moving people around in the organization. So in the future, there are some things that I want to do to continue to follow up on this that I think are interesting and I, I continue to focus on. One is to see if, if leaders are generally chosen based off of these traits. So is this something that people are considering? I also think comparing these with successful leaders would be interesting to see if this is a complementary thing that we want to do to look at traits and behaviors in kind of a bigger picture view to understand what people want and, and what we need to give them. And then look at this throughout the company. Look at this both in leadership and in followers. 
So what do leaders want in their followers? What do followers want in their leaders? How does this change at different levels of an organization? And ultimately, and this is bringing me back to this point I said at the beginning, use impression management techniques to help leaders give subordinates what they want. So I'm not suggesting here that you need to see what people, you know, ask a group of followers what they want in their leader and then go find someone who has those traits. I'm suggesting that this can be very developmental as well, that leaders in certain positions may find more success with the followers they have just by acting a little different, that is exhibiting traits that may be slightly different than kind of what they would default to. And a simple example is, if you have a leader who's introverted, doesn't mean that they have to act introverted and they have to you know, fail to be successful because they're introverted. It means that you can teach them to be extroverted, even if that means after they get done talking to, to subordinates or get home for the day, they go just hide in a corner and read a book because that's all they really wanna do. So we can use impression management techniques, I think, to develop. And so really this is both selecting, developing, um, and kind of the full functions of choosing leaders. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, I appreciate being invited to give this talk today and I hope you found it somewhat interesting and informative and uh, I'd be glad to field any questions. I have received, thank you very much, Austin. We've received a question from the audience. Where would you put Jacinda Hearn from New Zealand in, in the grid that you presented? Um, where would I put what exactly? Um, in the leadership uh, 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 dimension, where would you put Jacinda Hearn from New Zealand? Uh, are you talking about in the transformational leadership? Yes. So I think well, this is the context, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I don't, I don't have a, an exact answer for that. The general idea would be that um, transformational leadership, being those four things, is what the focus is. Um, it's not so much about, I mean, it's, a good, it's an interesting question, but it's not so much about taking all different behaviors and forms of leadership and trying to figure out where they are in that, although that would be really interesting to do. Um, I'm not sure that, that, um, that that's been done at this point. So, I mean, it's really, I think that as far as trying to figure out how to, whether or not to act in, in that way or in any particular way, it's about does it match on to these other things that are productive in leadership? And if it does, then we wanna highlight those. And if it doesn't, then we probably wanna focus less on those. Thank you very much. Um, Yusuf, do you have a question for Austin? Yeah, I, I, I do actually. Uh, it's good to see you, Austin. Hope, hope all's well. Um, it's also good to see that we can form by wearing the same jacket and shirt. So that's also good to see that, you know, I called your tailor, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sort of innovation at work. Um, so, you know, I, so I'm a strategy professor, right? So intellectually, I think we're coming at many of these questions from exactly the, uh, from diametrically opposed places, right? So let me give you my priors and then I'll ask the question. So my first prior is uh, I'm not a believer in the great man theory of historical change. Um, and my second prior is that if I, you know, that, that strategy, organizational strategy better explains organizational performance than the role of leaders per se. So, that, so those are my priors. So you know exactly where I'm coming from. So here's my question. I mean, how, do, how, how does organizational research of the kind that you're doing explicitly build a relationship between organizational performance and the behaviors and traits of leaders? It's a good question. So I think um, first to address your second, well, I'll leave your first prior because I think that's a very outdated theory from over a hundred years ago. Um, but the second one, um, I think the, the, my view and maybe what other people in kind of organizational um, behavior or psychology research believe 
is that there is no one best that several things need to complement each other. And so I think, whereas you might say strategy is more important, I wouldn't say leadership is more important. I would say, A, without leaders, you have no strategy and B, they're both important. Like you need the strategy and then you need the leaders to enact that strategy. So to me, it's all complementary. Um, and and I, th I think that's kind of, you know, especially in the context of an MBA, I think what you're getting is a whole bunch of different information that all on its own is important, but together is what makes an organization um, as successful as it can be. So with that said, um, the, I would say generally speaking, the link between behaviors and personality to productivity is often through more psychological concepts. So in, in my research that I provided here, I like to throw in something from different kind of levels of the organization, um, you might say. So that's, so the reason is I looked at job satisfaction to understand the person. Okay, so as a subordinate, am I happy or not? I put in leader member exchange, which is essentially how well I get along with my leader because that's more of a relational uh, outcome. And then I put in or organizational commitment because now we're at the organizational level. So how committed am I to the organization? And I think the, the tricky thing for some people, especially outside, uh, like especially your kind of finance um, people and accounting and so forth, I, I admit that it's often difficult to show them an exact effect on a bottom line, you know, when you do some of these things, because it is a process, you know, it's, it has an indirect uh, effect on a lot of this. And so, for example, we may be making people more satisfied and by being more satisfied, they may stick around for longer and trying to tell you as a company, how much longer people stuck around because of this and then showing the turnover costs and how much money they saved and how they were able to, to keep this, um, this expertise around from these people not leaving and all of this stuff is really hard to quantify. And I think that's definitely a challenge. Um, whereas, you know, I think you rightfully say that when you change a strategy, it's, it's a lot easier to see the direct effects of that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. No, it does. And um, Thomas, are there other questions that you like that others want to ask? Otherwise I can come back in. He's muted. You're muted, Thomas. Here we go. Sorry. Um, we have a question from the audience, from Andrew. I'm, I quote, Austin, so pleased to hear that conscious behavioral co choices are an effective way forward for improving leadership skills and efficacy. I'm a firm believer in this, and I'm dedicating many hours to this exact practice. Welcome on board. I think uh, that's, that's quite a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I... I think, and kind of in, in the context of how I ended the talk, conscientiousness is one of these things we often think of as part of someone's personality, but I think it's, it's shown in so many contexts to be so important, and it's something we can train people to do, you know, because these are in part behaviors. You might naturally be inclined to be organized and responsible and so forth. But a lot of people are very successful because they learn how to do these things, even if it doesn't kind of come naturally. Um, so yes, thank you very much for your comment. Um, I appreciate it. I'm very glad to, to also be on board um, and to, to see hopefully a lot of you in the classroom um, this, this summer. Do you think, another question, do you think that leadership um, will change um, because of the pandemic? Leadership is always changing. Um, and so in that way, the answer is yes. I think one of the biggest challenges for leadership because of the pandemic and something that will stay around is ex exactly what we're doing right now. We're not in a classroom. We're not in person. We're not interacting as we did for all of time, you know, until, you know, a year ago. 
And so I think the biggest way leadership is going to change is having to be cognizant of, of and understand what is effective in a virtual environment. And I really think it comes down to taking a lot of the things we've already learned about leadership, including some of the things I talked about today, and just learning how to, how to do that virtually. Um, and so, you know, conscientiousness, it may be more about how quickly you respond to emails rather than just simply whether you kind of come through on your task or not. So all of these things, I think, are going to tell people who we are and they're going to be behaviors that we look at that um, are in a different context and, and different than we used to. So, yeah, it's a great question. And to me, virtual leadership is going to be the next thing because this is not going away, um, even though, you know, I do expect it to subside quite a bit once we're allowed to be in person again. Right. I I just received another question. How do you think going forward we can help people do things like empathize and act conscientiously with more earnest and consistency? Yeah, that's great. Well, just the where you, where the question's coming from, I think is encouraging. Um, empathy again is one of these things that can be trained. And so I think kind of both at this question and also going back to, to the core of use this question, there are so many person-related things in an organization right, that, again, may not be so obvious on the bottom line directly, but that are important to the overall organization, the function of the organization. And a lot of those, we have research on how we can train those. And there is empathy training. You know, there is such a thing where if you wanted to, you could go in your organization and train everybody you know in a day on trying to be more empathic and so i think i think the the great answer is we can train people to do that and we should and i think that would be really helpful for for a lot of a lot of things and again in this virtual environment bring that back in probably more so than ever because it, it's so much harder i think to be interpersonal with someone when you're staring at a screen. Thank you very much. Um, do you think our business is more cooperative now instead of being highly competitive and secret? I would say that's extremely cultural. So I think, I think it really is going to depend on where, what the country is. I think there are certain circumstances and situ well, probably examples where the opposite has happened. Um, that when people aren't face-to-face, -face, they can kind of do more things in the dark. Um, but I do think there has been a push over the last many years to be, be more transparent and be more cooperative. And so I do think that's definitely happening well, as well. And I think that society is pushing business in that direction. So if nothing else, there's definitely a, an ongoing pressure in that direction. Great. Um, I would like uh, to thank you very much for your keynote speech and the, the research presentation that you provided. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to move on to our last part of this evening to the general Q&A session. I have collected your questions um, from the chat box and I would like to start to, um, with the elephant in the room, which is COVID. Um, Yusuf, can you tell us um, what are the COVID measures on campus and are we moving to online education? And if not, why not? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, CEU follows all public health guidelines as imposed by the authorities in Austria and Hungary, number one. Um, number two, um, we are not an online program, so we do everything we can in our power to offer in-class education. In fact, currently the way the program's operating is we, are, we, we have a hybrid learning model where we have a, the majority of folks physically in class when that's possible. And we have some folks who can't get in uh, to the Schengen area because of um, uh, travel restrictions um, being online. Um, you know, the questions that, that were being asked of Austin, I mean, I think are really, are really kind of important questions. Um, we believe that one of the main benefits of an executive MBA program are the networking opportunities. And many of those networking opportunities are not possible in a virtual context. And so um, 
our standing operating uh, procedure is to have in-class teaching as far as possible, which are fully compliant with public health regulations in force at the time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, can you talk, um, can you elaborate please on the importance of leadership in the curriculum and how it's going to be taught in class? So, I, you know, I think uh, in, in seeing Austin's presentation today, I think, you know, you will have got a good flavor for, uh, uh, for how leadership is going to be, is going to be taught. Um, what I would say is I think, you know, we take a holistic view of, of leadership, um, you know, which is why in the leadership program in the different modules, uh, while Austin leads the, the uh, leads the program, he has various people from different disciplinary perspectives contributing sort of ethics, philosophy, strategy, and so on. Um, the three modules are good decisions. So we have um, one, of the, one of Europe's leading thinkers in choice architecture, uh, Christoph Heinz, who looks at sort of decision-making um, as part of that module. We then have a good culture in the second leg of the leadership program, which focuses on organizational aspects. And I think the work that Austin is doing here really kind of, I think has a lot of very important things to say about that. And then the final element of the leadership program is what we call good life, which examines uh, work-life balance, which I think for many executives is a very important part of being a leader, not just about leading organizations, but also leading their broader life, uh, both with organizations, friends and family. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. What is the uh, academic umbrella concept of the of the executive MBA? Can you clarify what you mean by umbrella concept? The narrative, like what's you know the thread of, okay. of the whole thing? Yeah, so you know, I, 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 for me as a as a co-director, I would say there are three things that we really want to achieve in this program. The first is to help highly successful mid-career executives go from being functional leaders, operational leaders, to becoming strategic leaders, number one. Uh, number two um, is to encourage our participants to engage in a cross-functional, cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral discussion about how to run organizations better and how to interact with the broader society. And number three is to conduct that analysis and that exploration using the principles of open society, which is facts, not narratives. So I think those are my three key messages, I think, from, for the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How, is, um, how, how does the evaluation and assessment take place in the modules? Are there any exams? Yeah, uh, again, great question. So um, an MBA program is a multidisciplinary program. So different professors from different backgrounds will look to work with the participants and assess them using different methods. So if you're taking a finance class, there's a very good chance you've got an exam. If you're taking an accounting class, there's a very good chance you've got an exam. If, however, you're taking marketing or you're taking strategy, um, there's going to be different assessment methods. Probably some kind of team presentation will be part of the mix. Uh, some kind of very focused applied research project. You know, what one of the things we try and do is we try and make the learning as relevant to your organization as possible. So for example, in strategy class, the final deliverable is an individual assignment, which is a company or organizational strategy analysis, where you take some of the tools and models that we learn in strategy and apply it to your organization. And then, you know, in, in other subjects where, um, it's experiential learning. Again, I think leadership falls squarely into that frame. You're gonna have assessments which are based upon teamwork, team presentations and team interactions. So in some, it's the range from traditional exams, individual exams through uh, projects, individual assignments, team assignments through to much more experiential learning techniques. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I have received a question on the 360 degree peer review. Um, the person who uh, sent in the question says, I've read about the peer review. How does it work and what does it mean? So, you know, in a class of 65 participants, while, you know, while a faculty member can develop some insights into uh, a person's contribution to the class, 
it's it's not possible for them to completely avoid bias and to be able to know exactly how each and every one has contributed so our philosophy for peer review is to enable mature professionals to assess each other's contributions um and and we've developed you know a, a robust uh, assessment tool um, which the faculty are encouraged to use uh, to aid uh, 360 degree review which as many folks on this on this webinar this evening know is a, a very common practice in in organizations today um thank you very much i've heard about electives can you uh, make examples of what ele electives you offer yeah of course um so as i said to you during the 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 program presentation you know over the three-year period there's going to be around up to 50 electives made available for you to choose from obviously you can't take all 50 electives but what we try and do with the electives is is achieve two things first of all we use electives as an opportunity to bring in world-class faculty from around the world and from leading institutions to deliver cutting-edge developments in their particular field uh, so in the August module coming up for our M EMBA 22, currently in class, you know, uh, we'll have professors from Columbia coming in, Stockholm School of Economics, teaching various subjects. So when we put the electives together, we want to cover a broad range of disciplines, marketing, finance, strategy, uh, organizational behavior, uh, economics. Uh, we've got a course on geopolitics in the uh, elective offering. Um, a new product development and innovation um, and so on. So we try to offer a nice, broad, inclusive range of electives, which you know, enable participants to go beyond their core area of expertise and kind of uh, broaden out their understanding. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned team projects. Can you give some examples of um, these team projects, the titles of these? Uh, and the content of them? Yeah, so for example, in, in the leadership program for EMBA 22, we had uh, the teams put together a scenario planning analysis for a particular case study we assigned, which was um, uh, Vodafone in Egypt. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll also have uh, team presentations. So, you know, the professor will give, give, the, give the team a particular project or topic and they'll present, uh, they'll present their papers. Um, we have support teams, and I, I haven't mentioned this so far, but I think this question gives me an opportunity to do so. So when, when you join the program, uh, we put you with a group of four or five other people, and these support teams work together for several modules. We, uh, we currently um, rotate twice in the program. So after module four, I think after module seven, so you'll get to work in three support, different support teams during your time with us in the program. And the support teams are made up of diverse participants across sectors, countries, and interests. And the idea is, is that we want you to kind of interact with each other, um, learn from each other, um, manage conflict with each other. I mean, I think, I think an important feature of, of teamwork in an MBA program is, is that hierarchies are not explicit, they're implicit hierarchies in some circumstances, and managing the fact that hierarchies are implicit, in other words, that no one has the official right to lead a team, means that there's a fair amount of storming, norming, and performing that goes on. What is the teaching style like um, with um, regard to traditional lecturing or small groups? So yeah, so we don't do lecturing in this program um, but nor do we believe that you can't have interactive classes with larger groups so as i say i mean because of covid it's a different situation because we have to maintain the physical distancing so we don't have a single class of 65 currently um, but you know the idea that a professor can lead a discussion among a class of 65 people in an interactive way is a skill that we're very proud of among our faculty and in fact if you you look at the very top business schools in the world, the Harvards, NCADs, LBSs of this world, um, they will have executive MBA classes of up to 100 people and the professor will be expected to manage a discussion. I think, I think one of the things that we want to do with our, with our learning environment is while we have a class of 65, we'll use opportunities to have breakouts. So perhaps if we're teaching a case, 
you know, after maybe a 25 minute plenary session where we kind of get different perspectives, the professor will say, okay, fine. I want you to go off into your support teams for the next 20 minutes and look at the following question. And then we'll come back again and we'll explore, um, explore the question. Um, I'll add one more thing. Um, in any learning experience, there are going to be times when the professor needs to get across what you might call kind of, you know, basic information. We encourage the faculty to do as much of that in the pre-module reading. So you kind of get that out of the way so we can then just like, you know, hit the accelerator and go. But there may be times, you know, you know, I'm not a finance prof or an accounting prof, but there may be times simply when the prof just has to say, okay, fine. You know, here's how you calculate the following thing. But that's not the rule. That's the exception. Uh, the rule is interactive peer-based learning. I mean, in my classroom, I talk about sort of, you know, co-creation. So when I come in as a strategy professor, I've got some ideas, but I, I am 100% certain that when I walk into the class and when I walk out of the class, what I planned is not what I end up with because it's the quality of the interactions of the participants and the knowledge that I gain from them, which I think is the really kind of, you know, the really cool aspect of the way we do things. How would you describe the the balance between academia and practitioners? Up to theory, down to practice. So our professors are exceptionally well-educated people with doctorates, as you saw when I did the brief kind of, you know, run through of the faculty and you've had an experience today with, with Austin, just like top-notch scholars in their field, but they've learned how to make that knowledge applicable in the business context. Um, most of our faculty are active in, active in consulting and executive training outside of the classroom. Um, and, this is, and this is a professional degree. So it's not about theory. It's about how theory helps us make better decisions in the real world. Mm -hmm. I would like to um, start to conclude the evening with the last three questions that I noted so far. Um, what are our efforts to ensure diversity in class? Good question. Um, let me reiterate that we have an extensive scholarship program, which is a merit-based scholarship program, which targets key groups that we want in, in the classroom, uh, minorities, um, underrepresented groups in business, particularly women, um, LGBTQ um, participants, uh, and so on. And our messaging and our targeting is specifically aimed at ensuring That in a class of 65, all four sectors, corporate, entrepreneurial, uh, mission, not-for-profit, and public sector are represented. Because it's when these different sectors interact that the most innovative ideas are generated. Mm -hmm. um, can you please uh, mention the formal criteria and the application process? Uh, yeah, probably, Thomas, you probably know more about that than I do, but um, I'll give you what I know and feel free, Thomas, to add stuff that I've left out. Yeah. So obviously you have to apply um, and that's a formal process. You know, we're an American university accredited in the United States. So we have minimum standards that must be met. So work experience requirement, leadership experience. Uh, if you have a degree from a non-English language program, you have to prove proficiency in English. I mean, obviously, if you if you have 25 years of experience, And so working in, a multi in an American multinational in 25 different countries, you probably know how to speak English. So we can probably find a way around the formal testing of your English language. But nevertheless, that's a standard requirement. You have to submit a CV. You have to submit uh, professional reference letters, uh, academic reference letter. You know, for, again, for some participants who are joining the program with, you know, 20 years since they left university, we may be able to find a way to waive the academic requirements, but we definitely need your professional references. Uh, what else do we need? Uh, we want a cover letter uh, and we don't want a generic cover letter. So we want you to really address uh, why it is that you want to join this program, not just an MBA in general. And in fact, should your application materials be such that we want to invite you for an interview, our faculty to interview will ask you that exact question, which is like, okay, fine. Explain why you want to do an MBA in general, And why do you want to do an MBA with CEU? And why does CEU present you an opportunity to do an MBA in a way that can't be done elsewhere? Um, so, and so 
the interview comes after the application process. Um, after the interview, uh, the committee that selects candidates convenes, the inter interviewer will submit uh, an interview form based upon the 45 to hour long conversation you have with them. We add that to your application materials and then a recommendation is made uh, on your admission. And then all recommendations uh, are sent to the president and rector of the university, which is currently Michael Ignatia, but from September of um, uh, this year will be a new rector. And it's the rector who says up or down um, on your um, acceptance. And I have to tell you, uh, this isn't just, you know, like pro forma. Uh, we sent a batch of 10 candidates that we want to bring into the program this week. And the president was pretty granular about one or two of the candidates on the list and had very specific questions about uh, applications. So we are both proud and committed uh, to a very thorough um, assessment of everybody, everybody's application, which means that most of the time when you get an offer letter, you show up to our program because the vetting process is such that by the time you've got to that stage, you want to be with us and we want you to be with us. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask the last question and I would like to take over that um, uh, last question because it deals with scholarships, the question about tuition. Um, the tuition, basic tuition is 25,000 euro and we offer a variety of financial support to you. We have the open world scholarship, we have need-based scholarships and we have country specific merit-based scholarships. But I would kindly ask um, you to uh, book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me in order to discuss your individual scholarship because there's no like fits all scholarship. We have to discuss it um, individually. And I kindly invite you to book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me um, via the link that I just shared. I think it's the best opportunity to, you know, get to know each other and to, um, to uh, optimize your application. Um, thanks everybody. I mean, we've uh, reached 7.30. Um, I would like to thank everybody, Benny, uh, Martin, and the attendees for joining us. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, um, see you next time. Thank you very much.